into it today. You know what politics is, right? You've watched it on TV, right? You know, somebody promises you something, and if you like what they promise, you vote for that person, right? Do you have a student government here? Yeah. Do they do the same thing? No. Okay, who's, who's, <laughs> all right, is, who's in student government? All right, what was your platform? What did you promise them? He promised you stuff, didn't he? Did he do it? Did he? Did he? Did he? Huh? Huh? Hey? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, all right, all right. So, right. right. This is, but isn't this what politics is, right? Did he? He tried, right? Okay. But, but he, so he fooled you. Right? So he, but he promises something. This is what politicians do, right? We promise you something. If you like what I promise, you'll vote for me. Isn't this how it works, right? The problem is, what does the natural law promise you? This is going to be our problem. This is what we've got to figure out. Because if it doesn't promise anything, it's not going to fit into our system of politics. So let's go back a bit. There is no natural law political party. Well, actually there is, but it's not really what Aquinas would understand as natural law. There's a natural law party of the United States of America. Anybody heard of this? Yes? What? Good. Do you know what they do? They actually think that all of our problems, from crime to cancer, are caused by psychic stress. So their platform, their promise, is that if we have group meditation sessions, all of our problems will go away. That's not really Aquinas, is it? That's not Augustine. That's not what we're going to be talking about. So let's ignore them. Let's try to think about how politics, what we have today, modern politics, how it works. Well, the first thing is, and this is what's going to make it difficult for natural law. The first thing to remember with, with politics as it's developed over the last few hundred years is the people who thought it up thought that nature is bad. Now, what can, what's, bad, what's bad about nature, right? Come on, it's pretty. You like to go walking. Let me try to find this here. All right, so I'll start way over on this, this end. So we start out with nature. We learn that nature's bad. Why is nature bad? How could nature be bad? Isn't it beautiful? We like nature, right? We recycle, kind of. Right? We turn off the lights when we remember, right? We like nature, right? Yeah. How's nature bad? It will kill you. <laughs> Nature is going to kill you. The only thing that's keeping you alive right now is that somebody built this ceiling, that we have hot air coming out of these vents. That's not nature, people. That's engineering. Some really smart people came up with an idea to say, let's not be natural. Natural is running around in the wo woods, freezing your toes off. Nature is bad. It wants to kill you. Thomas Hobbes, writing in the 17th century, that's the 1600s, right? Writing in the 17th century, said that life in the state of nature is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And he wasn't just describing himself. This is what life would be like for all of us. We're going to die early out there in nature unless we do something to stop it. What do we do to stop it? We conquer it. Right? The first thing that we have to do is conquer nature. How do we do that? Two ways. On the one hand, we use science. and the other, we use politics. Science is giving us this nice heat. OK? Science is giving us this nice light. Now, it's not the most beautiful room in the world, but it's functional, right? We're not freezing. Oh, come on. 
I can't say that? It's a love, it's that, I've, I've been walking around the center, it's a beautiful center, and then you come, where'd all the popcorn foam come from? Why here? Right? What, you've never looked at the ceilings before? You must not have, you're all looking up. Okay, so science gives us all of this wonderful stuff. Right? We're not freezing, it is a really cold day. Did you have to go outside at 4.45 this morning? Yeah. Did you like it? No. no, awful, isn't it? But fortunately, we don't have to be out there all the time. We can be in here and be warm and get food out over here, this little place. What is it? Snack the snack bar. You can get food at the snack bar. Isn't that nice? We have snack bars. Right? Science gives us all sorts of comforts. It makes us comfortable. It makes us safe. The idea is that we can find a political system that does the same thing. How are we going to do that? That became the great challenge of the next 200 years, coming up with a political system that can make us as safe as science makes us. Now what do we do? Let's go back to science. Anyone who wants to be an engineer. Let's think about science. What do you do when you try to figure out how to use nature? What do you do with it? You want to make something like this room. You want to make a heating duct. What are you going to do? What's the first thing you have to do? What's that? Get heat. No, I want to, how do you get heat? You got the end, end. come on. What do you do? Plan? Okay. Develop? Blueprints, good. All right. What else? What else do we need? Knowledge, brainstorm, right? How about understand how nature works? Wouldn't that be good? Okay. One thing that we know about nature and how it works is that going to happen every time I do it? I drop it. See? Ah, <laughs> talk about dropping it. Right? Now, can I figure out how that worked? Can I figure out the arc? Yes? And is it going to be the same every time? If I throw it the same way every time, is it going to work, go the same way? Right? Okay. So, I can come up with rules. Am I defying nature when I do this? Or am I using it? I'm using it, right? I'm not, it's not magic. And it's not supernatural or unnatural, anything I'm doing. It's entirely in accord with the rules that are already out there. So that's how science works. So I use the rules of nature to do something that is unnatural. Look at this. The fluorescent lights are unnatural. Not only does it make all of you look kind of green, and I assume you're not really green. It's, it's forcing nature to do some really weird stuff. Like glow in a dark room in the middle of the day. So we have all the sunlight outside, so we build a room with no windows, and then we put lights inside of it to pretend that there's sunshine. This is what we do. So we use nature to conquer nature. How do we do this in politics? Hmm, there's the question. We use politics? Yeah. Good answer. What do we use? What is the politics we use? What do the politicians use? All right, but what's the campaign talking to me about? That's how it talks to me. Commercials, t what's that? Promises. promises. What's the promise about? And if I want some, you to give me something, I have what? Power. Not yet. I don't quite have power. I might want power. What else? No, you have the resources. I want them. I want the, you to give me stuff, right? 
I want you to give me stuff. I want the politicians to give me stuff. I have, and here's the word that they use all the time, I have interests, I have desires, I have needs, and there are two things you can do. You can try to get rid of them, change me, or you can use them, use my interests to control me two options. You can control my interests or change them. Those are your options. Now, there's a whole history of people who try to change us. Science is about conquering nature, right? We talked about that. Politics is about controlling human nature, and there are two ways to do it. Use those interests or eliminate them. A whole group of people want to change or eliminate the interests. But here, with the control of interests, that is what the American Constitution was designed to do. To control your interests. To realize that you have things that you want to do and say, that's okay. Go get them. You want to be rich? Go ahead. You want to be powerful? Fine. Do it. But, we're going to set it up in such a way that you can't hurt anybody. So the fear was always, if you have interests, if you want to be rich, if you want to be powerful, what's the best way to do it? You go and you kill a lot of people, right? You become the king. You kill people, you become king, you have everything. Is that a good way to set stuff up? Well, it is if you're the king, come on. But not if you're everybody else, right? So what do you do if you're everybody else? Make it so some people can't, do, can't go all the way, but they can get partway there. <coughs> if you give everybody the opportunity to get partway there, then maybe they're satisfied enough that they won't try to take, care, take over everything. So what the American founders did, let's, find it in Federalist 10, the Federalist Papers, written by Hamilton, Jay, and Madison. In Federalist 10, James Madison will become president of the United States, the fourth president, explains that if you have enough different people, each one pursuing their interests, you will never have a large enough group of those people never pursuing the same interests. So you'll never have a big enough group to take over. By letting people follow their interests, not getting rid of their interests, you build up so many that compete that no one group can win. Now, when you have a pizza party, what kind of pizza do you usually get? What is it? 
Why? What if I like anchovies? Not everybody likes. Well, how many people like anchovies? No one. One, two of us. Okay. Three. All right. Can we impose anchovies on the rest of you? No. All right. How, who, who likes corn on their pizza? How about a fried egg on your pizza? Yeah, I, I'm t look, in England, this is common. Fried egg and sweet corn pizza. Cheese pizza with a, with a fried egg on top of it and cor corn niblets. Does that sound nice? No, it sounds nasty, right? Okay. All right. What else do you like on your pizza? Pepperoni. How about something interesting, something different? Buffalo chicken. How many go for buffalo chicken on their pizza? All right, okay. Meatballs? Yeah, okay. Bacon? All right. Eggplant? All right, so a few eggplants. You're answering everything. <laughs> At one point, it's not going to be a pizza. Right? <laughs> but then how come, if you like all these different things, how come we always end up with cheese? Because whenever, because there's so many different tastes, so many different tastes, they cancel each other out and you get cheese. Right? So many different tastes, you know that even if the two of us, three of us, want to force anchovies on the rest of you. We can't do it. But I'm not going to eat any of your buffalo chicken nonsense pizza. <laughs> that just sounds rude. So we end up with cheese. Look what we get. Everybody's happy. Kind of. I'd be happier with anchovy. But I'm happier with cheese than I am with buffalo chicken, which I don't even understand. <laughs> so this is, how, this is how we balance interests. That's the solution here. In this famous Federalist 10, James Madison writes these lines. He talks about what would happen if there was a big enough majority, if you buffalo chicken people were able to take over this group. If you had enough votes for our pizza party to get only buffalo chicken pizza. Not everything, but only buffalo chicken pizza. Oh, all right. You had enough votes. There was a majority of buffalo chicken pizza people. What would happen? This is what he writes. If the impulse and the opportunity be suffered to coincide, means if you have the numbers and the desire, we well know that neither moral nor religious motives can be relied on as an adequ adequate control. You jerks would make us eat buffalo chicken. That's what you would do. That's what he's saying, that if you have the power, you will use it. You'll order buffalo chicken, right? Even if the rest of us don't like it. But if there are enough of you who do, you'll force us to order it. So we've got to set it up in such a way so that no group ever gets to force buffalo chicken on us. So we always end up with cheese. That's how we end up at pizza parties. And that's also how we end up with our politics. We have nice, safe, bland cheese pizza politics, which is fine. Because it's a lot better than having people force all sorts of crazy ideas on us. So from this idea of control and controlling interests, we have politics of clash. Clash of interests, 
I'll give you this. All right, you don't make me eat buffalo wings, chicken thing, whatever, pizza. I won't make you eat anchovies, not even you, right? Okay, we're all right with that? Right. But maybe, what about, what about pepperoni? Who'd be okay with pepperoni? We've got a show of hands here. Mm. Oh, you can take pepperoni off. Oh, oh yeah, but the taste does kind of seep in, right? Hmm. Well, what, what about people for um, uh, olives? No, no? See, okay. All right. See? Broccoli? Uh, onion? You guys have, like, no taste in anything. <laughs> this is why you end up with, with, with cheese pizza all the time. Okay, all right. So this is, this is how the political system works, right? And that, that passage I read from Madison, from Federalist 10, that passage I said, said neither moral nor religious reasons will stop us if we have the power to force buffalo chicken on pizza, on pizza, we'll do it. If we have the power and the opportunity and the will, we'll do it. And there's no moral or religious thing that's going to stop us. What he's saying is the natural law isn't effective. It's never going to work. Because even if it's there, even if you know what's right and wrong, you're not going to do it given the chance. So instead, we set up a system where you, you push against me and I push against you, you know, and everything stays up. As long as all the forces are balanced equally, everything stays up. Okay. But then let's get back to nature. I don't mean become hippies and not bathe. I mean, let's get back to the idea of nature. What if nature isn't bad? What if nature is good? What if there is a natural standard for the way we should act, the way we should behave, the things we should do? What if nature has something of an answer for us? Not just a negative, run away from it, it's bad, but a positive, it's good, something we should, we should have. How would that fit into our political system? What are we going to do? The problem here is that nature doesn't promise us anything. All of our politics, this whole idea, nature is bad, the political version of it focuses on interests to control leads us to promises. What does the natural law promise? It doesn't really promise anything. It doesn't tell us anything. Let's think of, of we'll start out with two issues that the natural law today in contemporary politics, these two issues are the ones normally associated with the natural law. Anybody interested in the natural law usually is involved with these. The pro-life, right, and traditional marriage. What does the pro-life movement promise you? No abortion. What's the promise? Who's going to be better off because of that? Who's going to win? Hmm? Who's going to win? You said, the baby, right? But, but, look at how effective the pro-abortion group is. Why? Because they can point out that having a baby isn't actually all that easy. They can make the promise that the woman's life is going to be a lot easier. Whose life, apart from the babies, whose life is made easier 
by banning abortions. No one's. So what, what right? So, so it doesn't fit into the world of promises. You can't say, your life is going to be so much happier. You're going to be richer if we ban abortions. You can't, you can't make that argument. And nobody does. So where does the, the idea come from? It comes from nature. That, regardless of our interests, regardless of what we want out of the world, killing innocent people is bad. That's the fundamental idea behind it. What about gay marriage? People are always waffling over gay marriage, right? I mean, what, do you, what, what am I supposed to think about this? You hear, the, you hear the question, does it hurt me if two gay guys get married? I mean, does it really hurt me? I, you know, there's sort of this whole, whole, whole idea of you know, the breakdown of the family, break, right? Okay, yeah, but maybe what I know is these two gay guys say, they're really upset that they can't. Where's the promise? Somebody can promise them, I'll make you happy and let you get married. But where's the natural law promise? We won't let them get married and who's happier? Where's your interest? Hmm? So how does natural law fit into this? One more example here. The Civil Rights Movement. In the letter from Birmingham Jail, Martin Luther King Jr. cited specifically the natural law of Thomas Aquinas. Said this is the natural law. An unjust law is no law, citing Augustine, whom Aquinas cited as well, and he's, then he refers to uh, the next two sentences later, he refers to the natural law of Thomas Aquinas, okay? And what, would it, what did it say? That we should not treat a whole group of people as less than human. There's the natural law. But what was the problem he faced? Here's what he wrote. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. No one is going to give up their interests. Was it in the interests of the white southerners to maintain segregation? Yeah, probably was actually. Was it in the interest of the black Southerners to, to end it? Absolutely, right? The problem is, and this is the problem he faced, if you simply put it in those terms, it's one group's interest against another group's interest. Just like everything else. And he had to show it's not like everything else. This isn't just, I want to raise taxes or I want to lower taxes. I want to change in this policy or that policy. He had to show that this issue is unlike any other issue. It's not one of interests. That was the whole point of his letter. That there is a problem outside of who wins and who loses. Whenever you violate the most important fundamental principles, even if you're happier because you get to violate them, it's still wrong. It's still wrong. But how do you do that? How do you explain to somebody, I'm going to make you unhappy 
and that's the right thing to do. I'm going to take stuff, I'm going to take your stuff away, and you're going to be better off because of it. Or not. You might be more sad. You might be upset. You might be miserable. But still, it's the best thing that can happen. How do you explain that to somebody and to convince them? Because that letter that King wrote was addressed to white clergymen. That was the purpose of his letter. So what do you do? Okay, here's a question. Some of you might have read about this, but here's a topic. I want a show of hands. Who thinks that dwarf tossing should be legal? Do you know what dwarf tossing is? All right, dwarf tossing. It's a sport. It's a sport. It's, a, it's not an Olympic sport. It's not Olympic. There, you know. Hold on. Hold on. It's a sport at nightclubs and bars. People get really drunk, and then if somebody gets into this padded suit with handles on the back, and you throw the person as far as you can, and you measure. Whoever, whoever throws them the furthest gets a free beer or something, right? Okay. How many think that this should be legal? You notice a definite gender breakdown here? All right. How many think it should be illegal? All right. Why? Why do you think it should be legal? What it was? Who said? Hey, one at a time. Come on, I can't hear everybody. What is it? Did oh okay? Did he want to do it? Does that make it? If it's voluntary? Well, this isn't you know a press gang. Let's find some guy and put him in a suit and throw him. That's not. A, it's voluntary. Okay. The guy gets paid for it. Does that change anybody's minds? It does. Okay. Show me who who. The dwarf gets paid for it. Who changes your, who's changed your mind because of that? Okay. Yeah, and it's, you're not forced to, right? You get paid, you get paid, okay. Who, who still hasn't changed their mind? That's still bad even if he gets, even if he gets paid for it. Who's, who's still willing to say that it, that it should be outlawed? One, two, Kind of, three, four, sort of, four and a half, right? Why? Why? Give me a reason why. What, what's what's that? It's it's what? Dehumanizing. Beautiful. What does it mean to be dehumanizing? What's dehumanizing? What's what what does that do to us? What's that? What does it do? Makes you feel less. All right. Less what? Less human. All right. Thank you. Dehumanizing. Just breaking down the term. Ah, come on. Didn't, don't you know you're not supposed to use the word in the definition? Right? What's that? Feel like an object rather than a person. You actually, well, actually you are being thrown, right? Okay. So... You're be, you're, well, hold on. We'll get back to the, the, the guys who, who do. All right, so wait a minute. So dehumanizing. You're being treated as an object, not a human being. What marks out a human being is, look at this, your nature. Is it okay to throw a basketball? Anybody have a moral objection to that? No. Right? And you throw a rock, not at somebody, but let's just say you're throwing rocks. Sure. But throwing humans is different, right? Yes. Yeah, it's different. Thank you. Because by nature, humans are different. But here's the problem. What if it's in the interest, what if this guy gets paid a lot of money and he wants to do this? Right? Okay. Did you read that essay? 
that was sent around? Some of you got the essay? In 1997, France outlawed the practice of dwarf tossing, made it illegal. And a dwarf sued them because that's how he made his, his, his living. He sued the French government for loss of income. He, lo he lost at the European Court of Human Rights. He lost because they said it was fundamentally undignified. But in this struggle of interests and control of interests and the promises you make, who is better off in the world by banning dwarf tossing? No one? No one? What, what sort of, could you make an argument that somebody would be better off by banning it? How would the dwarfs be better off? Their safety, it's a padded suit. It's a, it's a helmet with a padded suit. There's never been a dwarf tossing injury. It's safer than football. They would not feel, what, all right, no pun intended, right? <laughs> what, 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 Where's the benefit to the dwarf? This man, this man is now out of a job. Right? Where's the benefit? If somebody's going to make a promise, right? Because that's what politicians do. If you're going to make a promise about politics, where is this, how, is, how is this whole group of people better off because it's been banned? But is it, could it still be wrong to do this to people? Could it? Throwing people around? Treating them like objects? Yeah? Well, maybe wrestling. Maybe mixed martial arts. Maybe you know, when I was when I was a kid, we didn't have to pl wear helmets playing hockey. It was that long ago. Yeah, the world really was in black and white at one point. Do you think kids should wear helmets playing hockey? Yeah. Who thinks no? Ah, one. One no. Does everybody else think kids should wear helmets? Yes. Why? Safety. Oh, safety. So you're going to force it on them. So you're going to force that on kids, but not force a ban on Dwarf tossing. It's for their own good. What about smoking? Who thinks there should be a ban on smoking? Yeah, yeah we can get to that too. Right? I just want you to notice. All I want you to do is notice this. Notice this. Notice. I'm not saying anything right now about the morality of dwarf tossing, smoking, hockey, anything else. I'm not trying, uh, let's, just, let's just hold that aside. But look at how difficult it is to make an argument to each other about any of this stuff unless we can say somebody's going to get hurt. It's in somebody's interest to stop it or to permit it. Somehow it comes back to what's to interests. So whatever, whatever we come, whatever we think about in terms of the natural law, whatever's above this fight of interests, If it doesn't fit into the structure of promises, it's hard for us to talk about. It's hard for us to understand. OK. Done? Questions? Fights? <laughs> Applause. That's good. Thank you. I like that.
Uh huh. Like if you look at America, like the top five percent of uh, each of murders own more than half of the wealth and more than half of the property in the country. And their interests are the ones who are mainly represented. Are they? Well, if you look at every single president, with the exception of like two or three, all of them have been middle class to wealthy. Um, the most but of the more of the programs that actually are successful affect the wealthy than the poor. Just look at who has a greater chance of becoming a foreign power in politics. It's going to be a wealthy person or a rich person or a poor person. Right. But it's not that top percent. If yes, let's look at it. No, not everybody's come up from poverty into the presidency. A few have, right? But what's the alternative? What would be the alternative? The only alternative anybody else has ever tried is a monarchy. Because you've got to get the buy-in, right? If we're, going to t if we're talking about this, this controlling of interests, unless you're going to make everybody the same, and Madison gets into this in Federalist 10, either you have to brainwash everybody or you control interests, allow them some freedom. If I'm that top 1% and you start setting up a system that really hurts me, I can go elsewhere. I can make all sorts of mischief while I'm here. I can do all sorts of stuff and ruin this place because I own it. What do you do? You have to, to have some way of getting those people to buy in. So yeah, right? It used to be they're all, all only the king. Now, it's a pretty big swath of people who are involved. You get some people from bizarre backgrounds. I met somebody who was a, um, a computer, he's a computer repairman and local talk radio guest host. He's now a member of the House of Representatives. That wouldn't happen in a different type of system. Now, is he dirt poor? No. Did he have connections? Yes. He was on the radio, for heaven's sakes. But that's the balance of interests. It's not perfect. And that's where the natural law has a hard time speaking. Because you're right. You're saying, this is wrong. These people have this power. They have an unequal amount of power, right? Is that wrong? Is it, do you object to this? Who would object to, these, to some people having an overwhelming amount of power? Unequal to the rest. Anybody have a problem with that? It's just you and me, buddy. We're, we're <laughs> Watch out. You know, we've got to worry about the rest of them. But what's the solution? Right? I mean, this thing again, what Madison said. History shows us that if you have the power, you will use it. And the only way to, to, to stop it is to get some powers fighting against other powers. And what it's going to mean is you're going to have a lot of rich people at the top. But at least they're going to fight each other. You know the best thing about the U.S. Senate? Every, you get every person in the country who wants to become president, and you put them in one room so you can watch them. <laughs> they're going to be out there anyway. They're going to be out there, and they're going to try it. At least this way we know their names. We know what they look like, and we, we know what they're up to. But without a system like that, we wouldn't see them until it was too late. Is it perfect? No way. But what's the alternative? This is the sad thing. What's the alternative? You don't have to come up with it now. Maybe in 50 years we'll read your book. But uh, you know, this, is, this is the problem. What's the alternative? Without a buy-in from these powerful people, we can do nothing. OK, I think we have to end. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.